All right. Well, let's jump in. Um, so, welcome everyone to the uh, to the webinar. Uh, this is our third webinar that we've done. We've done the uh, Social Security webinar and also an estate planning seminar the last couple months. Today with me is uh, Russell Schwartz. Uh, Russell is uh, colloquially called a divorce attorney, but um, I think he would call himself an attorney in domestic relations litigation. Uh, personally, Russell and I um, have known each other for several years now, and I've seen him and we've worked together on a number of cases, and I found him to be uh, very thorough, very diligent at what he does, and um, I do actually see that there are a couple folks that are also on this work, uh, on this webinar, that are clients of Russell's, so I think they could probably attest to uh, how tenacious he can be in the courtroom, so um, some He's a, he's a great guy to have on board. He has over 30 years of experience, so uh, we're really happy to have him here. So, Russell, thank you. Thank you very much for being here. All right, so let's jump in um, to, the, to the seminar, and I'll start sharing my screen. All right, so... You should all see the uh, the the uh, our contact information there. Uh, six tips when contemplating a divorce. The first thing we have to get out of the way is disclosures. Um, so all of this information is going to be general in nature. So uh, please consult a legal or tax professional if you do want to act upon any of the information that is presented in this workshop today. Uh, so let's start. Um, so let's let's just start very basic. You know, you're you're thinking about um, have you know engaging in the divorce uh, process, um, and you're contemplating it. So what are some of the options for us that you have um, to potentially uh, see this through? I mean, in this divorce process, there are a lot of options that come up for folks in terms of how to resolve their cases. Uh, I'm a litigator. I'm a trial lawyer. Uh, we often will find ourselves in front of the judge uh, with another lawyer, making presentations, making our arguments in front of the judge. That's one option. We call it litigation. Uh, a second option is what is becoming very popular, and that's alternative dispute resolution. The most popular term we use today is mediation, conciliation, uh, and even private adjudication, where we will bring in a private judge to have one or more issues heard in a very quick uh, and efficient manner. Um, there are occasions where people can try to go through and navigate the process by themselves, although we don't generally recommend it. Uh, in those very, very simple cases where there's only one or two little issues, oftentimes we'll see that. But for the most part, it is uh, litigation and alternative dispute resolution. Uh, one. Litigation tends to be more complicated, tends to be a little bit more expensive. Um, conciliation and mediation is a little bit more efficient. Uh, not always as effective, but uh, yet a good option. Mm -hmm. And Russ, I, I, I know this kind of puts you in a tough position, but any ranges in terms of costs associated with each one of these? So a litigation, if it took six months, a year, five years, you know what that would look like. Uh, mediation, what that would look like. Obviously, if you did it yourself, you know, it's probably lower cost, but there's still a cost associated with, you know, completing the document. So any any feedback on that piece? Um, the litmus test that we use in litigation is that in Massachusetts, uh, the courts are requiring parties to be uh, done from beginning to end in their cases in about 14 months from beginning to end. Um, the courts, believe it or not, are getting a little bit more efficient, and we're finding ourselves in litigation uh, being being completed in the process in about 12 or so months, sometimes okay. less. Now, in, uh, in in fairness and in full disclosure, I also uh, participate as a uh, as a principal in a company called Why Litigate, and that is a alternative dispute resolution company, which does exactly opposite of what we do in litigation. Okay, uh, and uh, uh, so I have some kind of uh, metrics in terms of how effective it can be. Um, and again, litigation is for a certain type of folk who has a certain issue, and mediation is for a certain type of issue as well. Um, what we're finding is that if cases resolve themselves in mediation, they resolve themselves very quickly, or not at all. Okay. Uh, and that will 
generally happen within 30 to 90 days from beginning to end. Uh, and we'll know very quickly whether these issues that are brought to us will come to a final resolution. Litigation takes a little bit longer, obviously, but uh, it can move uh, at a more effective pace sometimes when a third party like a judge is involved. Mm -hmm. So just to summarize, uh, mediation, 30 to 90 days, um, but at the end of that 90th day, you'll probably know, is this actually going to get resolved or is it going to need to go to mediation? Well, that, let's go to litigation. litigation and that's sorry. true. I mean, we'll, we'll, we never know for sure how this works, but um, when folks are coming to a alternative dispute resolution uh, process, they're both coming with the mindset that they want to get done quickly, they want to get done uh, in a cost-effective way and with as and as peaceful and as mm -hmm. amicably as really can be done. So it's generally 60, 90 days. We have a pretty good idea. Sometimes it takes longer. I mean, we can uh, resolve matters in a matter of hours mm -hmm. if everybody's on the same page. That is not to say that two good divorce lawyers or family law attorneys can't be in the same room, come up with the same concept mm -hmm. and make some really good recommendations to their clients that will get them to the final resolution as well. Okay, so I'm going to put you on the spot here. Costs on, the, on all this? It's hard to say. Um, we, I tell my clients that I am an hourly wage employee, and okay. uh, the cost of our cases are directly related to the complexity of the cases. Got it. The complexity of the case is like uh, a chemical compound. Mm -hmm. So we have husband's lawyer, wife's lawyer, husband, wife, all different elements of a chemical compound. They either work well together, or they don't work well together. And, and that's a great analogy. I like that. <laughs> and of course, uh, the issues involved um, make things a little bit more complicated. There's sure. a lot of business valuations and a lot of experts that we need. It would slow down the process and, of course, make things a little bit more expensive. I'm sure the, the child aspect of that also is very, of course, and of course. can lead to a lot of complexity. Once children are involved, it becomes a whole another set and another set of issues that we have to contend with. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Um, well, let's uh, let's move along here. Okay. So let's talk about the emotional component. So you know, broad scheme, there are multiple ways of uh, of resolving a divorce with litigation, mediation, etc. But there's a, obviously a gigantic emotional component to to this. So talk to me a little bit about the role emotions play in the process. Um, there's no question that this process is an emotionally driven uh, process. When clients come to me and we talk about how to cope with this long-term or short-term event, we talk about the different ways to get through it. Um, I often tell my clients that being uh, active, uh, working out, exercising is one good way mm -hmm. to kind of keep things in check. Uh, I say to my clients, a healthy body turns into a healthy mind. Uh, we often will recommend that our clients consider some form of counseling uh, or group therapy to help them deal with these uh, issues that come up. And, and frankly, we just say that uh, we should be in charge. Lawyers will take the clients through the process. They have to trust us. They have to believe that if they take their foot off the gas, we'll bring them right through the process. We've done this many, many times, and we have a, a level of, of uh, confidence that we bring to the table, and we hope that they trust us mm -hmm. and let the process take take control. Got it. Okay. Um, so, you know, counseling, things like that, you know, so we have the uh, we have things up here on the slide. Um, you know, obviously, again, big emotions, especially in light of extramarital stuff. You know, uh, talk to me a little bit about that. Piece, you know, I think there is a, a, a misperception, or I shouldn't say a misperception, but maybe a myth that there is a blame game. You know, that if that if you can mm -hmm. if you can say that your husband, your wife did something, you know, that broke up the relationship, that that will lead to a different outcome. Can you talk a little about that piece? Sure. Ironically, the the truth is that people's conduct in this process today uh, doesn't have a lot of weight with the probate court. Extramarital relationships um, as such don't really carry a lot of influence one way or another. It's when the parties take their decision-making to a financial level that is affecting the other party. So let's say that 
one party is counting on an extramarital relationship and that party is spending, say, a substantial amount of money traveling with this other person or buying gifts or such. In that circumstance, it would matter. But the, the act itself, the conduct itself, not that significant. The probate court and the laws in the Commonwealth do say that party's conduct is one criteria that the courts use in determining how they're going to divide marital assets, how they're going to uh, determine whether alimony is appropriate or not. But it really goes to the financial aspect of uh, the relationship. Got it. Okay. Um, one of the things that, that's on the slide here is social media. <laughs> so I'm curious to see if social media is starting to play more and more of a role in um, these proceedings, you know, whether or not um, someone is a little bit too open and the other party actually uses that against them. Hey, have you had any experience with that? Yes. <laughs> we, uh, we find that social media is a, a positive and a negative for us. Um, we tell all of our clients that once they start this process, they keep their comments to themselves. They don't spread rumors. They don't talk negatively about the other spouse, particularly on social media. Now, when we are looking into background, into people and their behavior, their history, the very first place we look is on social media because people tend to either exaggerate their lives or depict their lives, whether it's drinking or activities that would be questionable. It's the first place that we, we look and it's the first place that it pops up. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess the rule of thumb is stay off the social media when you're going through this process. There's, no, there's absolutely no good that comes of it. And if anything, it uh, helps. It would help me if uh, they were on the other side. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's something that I, I, I thought would be the case, but it, it's interesting to actually hear that and, it, it plays a role. And not only that, um, some of the dating websites that people think uh, it's a good idea to go on to, they have their own profile. And there are folks who tend to, to either fabricate or bolster their financial circumstances, their marital relationship <laughs> circumstances. And uh, we take all of those off of social media. Interesting. And then we take them and at the time of the trial, that's the first thing we ask people about. The very first thing we ask. Wow. So that's a great off of social media. It's a great segue to our yep. next slide. So the next slide um, is organization. So logistically, um, what I mentioned to Russ prior to this meeting is that when we're meeting with folks in a financial planning setting, uh, usually, it, the, the the financial role of the family is usually on one person. I actually call them the CFO, the chief financial officer of the family. And then the other person, I jokingly say, has to be the CEO, the chief executive officer. And the, you know, in some cases, that chief financial officer is the is the enemy, <laughs> you know, and, and you are the CEO who doesn't really know that much about finances. So Logistically, what if you're not the person that handles the finances day to day, what are some of the things that they should do to because obviously, you know, the the act of getting all the all the financial information is very important to this process. How does someone go about doing that? The um, the probate court and the laws in the Commonwealth require parties to exchange all of this documentation that you'd be talking about. But when clients come to me. <clears throat> whether they're prepared or not, uh, we talk about organization because as you say, and as the slide indicates, being organized is incredibly helpful. It's helpful to the process, it's helpful to the lawyers, it's helpful uh, to getting a, a, a quick and efficient understanding of the case. So what we say to our clients is that when they come to us, either before the first meeting, <clears throat> during our initial consultation, or after the first meeting, they should try to accumulate as many documents as they can, at least within the first year's worth, if not up to three years, worth of tax returns, uh, pay stubs, bank statements, canceled checks, um, retirement account statements, qualified, non-qualified retirement account statements, anything that they can uh, accumulate uh, so that we can get a sense as to what their initial financial baseline is. It also gives us a sense as we're running through credit card statements and cancel checks as to what people are spending money on, what they shouldn't be spending money on, and it gives us a direction as to where we go. So being organized is incredibly helpful in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said to you, we are hourly wage earners, and the more that a client can do to help us, the more efficient and the more effective we can be, and of course, we pass that savings right on to the client. So that's a really good point. So um, 
let's say that we have a situation where, once again, you, you know, you are not the chief financial officer of the family, and you're concerned that the person who is the chief financial officer is hiding assets or doing something where they're trying not to disclose everything. How, how do you handle that in that situation? Um, well, it's ultimately, it is my job uh, to take off my lawyer hat, put my investigator hat on, and start to drill down and figure out where the assets are, where they uh, have gone, where they come from. Uh, sometimes we hire a forensic accountant to do it. Uh, sometimes we start simply by looking at a, a federal income tax turn, a return. Ironically enough, uh, the non-CFO uh, often doesn't realize that the dividends that are created from assets that they have are shown on the tax return. Mm -hmm. So we start with tax returns if we can get them. Uh, oftentimes, once we look through a, a checkbook register or a bank account, we see uh, automatic transfers that are going into or out of accounts. Those accounts show up on the uh, checkbook register, the different spots. Uh, oftentimes, we'll say to our clients, when you receive things in the mail that appear to be from um, you know, a financial planner or, or a holding house, make a photocopy them of them and bring them in. And oftentimes we will send out a subpoena to that company and ask for all the documents that are referencing either one party or the other. Yep. So it, it's so not we've that- We've seen that with yeah. some of the clients that we've worked together It with. is not that easy, but uh, if you know what steps to take, and we've done this for a long time, more often than not, we can find the missing links. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. All right, let's keep moving along. Making some good progress. It, um, in the middle of this, you know, feel free, you know, to raise your hand and or there is a question and answer button at the bottom of the screen. Um, if the, if we do see that uh, flash up, we will answer that question for you on the fly. I do know that one of the attendees actually asked a question uh, prior to the event. So we'll get to that in the question and answer section of this uh, of the meeting. But feel free if anything comes up to ask those questions. All right. So. Uh, next slide here. So taking responsibility. So this here is something that um, I think Russ and I share um, in our professions as financial planner for me, <laughs> a divorce attorney here, is the procrastination uh, piece. You know, at the end of the day, um, you know, procrastination sidetracks a lot of this. And, and one of the things that's very common, especially, again, going back to that non-CFO person, you may feel overwhelmed by this whole process, and it's it's tempting just to kind of put your head in the sand and just hope that things get better. When deep down, you kind of know that things really won't get better. So, uh, so Russ, talk to me a little bit about being proactive. Um, you know, trying to just take the bull by the horns, especially as it comes down to the kids and the impact that um, you know two warring factions have on the family and development and things like that and just kind of taking the bull by the horns the, the the first question is when when is somebody ready to get divorced mm -hmm. when are they actually what makes them ready um there's no real answer although i say to my clients when they come to see me for initial consultation i'll ask them uh if they're ready and they will either serve me with a kind of a blank stare or kind of say yeah well i'm not really sure and what I say to them is, when you're 99% sure you're ready to be divorced, you're not ready. And so you have to be 100% ready to go uh, because the process is a long process. It can be a long process and it, uh, in some circumstances difficult. Um, the beginning of your case starts here and the end of the case starts here. So if we are, if this is our time frame and we're starting today, uh, here's the end. Mm -hmm. But if we wait another year, we start here and we end here. And that's something that we have to really put into perspective. So um, at least when you're on the ropes about making a decision as to whether you go forward, it's always good to buy an hour of a lawyer, lawyer's time, kind of scrimmage the ideas. Uh, we often say to our clients that knowledge is power. Uh, and this is a good opportunity to kind of scrimmage the issues with your lawyer. Uh, more often than not, what we find is that our clients come out of the meeting feeling much more uh, enlightened, empowered. they feel more confident, they sure. feel more empowered, uh, and um, more often than not, they either retain our firm that day or within a week or so after they contemplate kind of mm -hmm. the decision. Got it. Okay. Um, just looking at some of these notes here. Well, let me just say one, yeah. one more thing, and we're talking about one of the slides. Um, mm -hmm. 
there are lawyers who believe that they're completely in control of the process and their clients should not have much to say about things. I think our world has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. I think our clients um, should and do have a fair degree, a high degree of control as to the outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever uh, clients have the opportunity to control their own destiny, whether they try the case or settle the case, they make the final decision. So clients, uh, people who participate in this process should not be passive observers. They should be actively involved. They should tell their lawyers and articulate to their lawyers what they want, mm -hmm. why they want it, even if it doesn't make sense, even if it doesn't make sense to the lawyer, because to some extent, uh, sometimes being happy is better than being right. Mm -hmm. And uh, more often than not, when we have a client who is in control of their destiny, cases often settle faster mm -hmm. than if they don't know. Because once they put it in the lawyer's hands, then it takes on a life. So. Sure. I think that's another good segue to the next slide, which is focusing on the big picture. So, you know, one of the things that Russ and I sometimes joke about, and well, actually, I've probably heard you say this almost 10 times or so, is that he's going to go to court today to fight over pots and pans. Um, and, you know, he jokes about it, but, you know, it sounds like that actually happens a lot where people get really kind of hung up on the minutia of the divorce uh, proceedings. So, Talk to me a little bit about focusing on the big picture, you know, and trying to stay away from getting mired in those pots and pans. The, the pots and pans analogy is a fair one. We we really don't fight over pots and pans anymore. Um, anymore because anymore because we have ways and methods now with conciliation and and mediation that we can send folks if we're litigating over values of businesses or custody cases or really important issues uh, in the middle of a divorce. Um, who gets you know the the coffee pot or the, the, the silly pan that came from Aunt Josie mm -hmm. uh, is really not uh, something that we're going to spend a lot of time on at X dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we end up doing is sending those issues out to be resolved. Um, in this day and age, we see a transformation in terms of people putting all of those things in perspective. We don't get a lot of that anymore. We don't mm -hmm. see people really fighting about those issues uh, in any great detail. Mm -hmm. um, but the truth of the matter is that, that we do have our clients often uh, think about putting things in perspective and recognizing that uh, sometimes it's better to be happy than it is to be right because being right just costs a lot more money and oftentimes there's no better result. Mm -hmm. So um, once clients can put it in perspective, allow their lawyer to give them opinions, make informed decisions, and then they take control of their own destiny, uh, the cases move in a much more uh, effective, more efficient yeah, oh, really. Okay. So big part of this slide is about the impact on children. Just got a question about uh, child support payments. Um, so the question is, under what circumstances could the child support payments amount be changed? Um, the law in Massachusetts says that all child support uh, uh, payments mm -hmm. are modified by law. Uh, in order to modify a child support payment, I'm assuming that there's a judgment of the court. In order to modify that, if someone would come to me and say, well, when do I modify it? Uh, we suggest that a modification takes place when there is what is called a substantial and material change in circumstances. Now, the courts can define that in a lot of different ways. Uh, sometimes it means a substantial uh, raise in the payor's income or a substantial raise in the recipient's income or a decrease in the payor's income or a custody change. Um, the best way to answer it is if you believe that there's been a substantial and a material change in circumstance, it's a custody change or uh, that you haven't been to court in a number of years and you're just wondering what the Massachusetts guidelines would now say, you can go online, uh, project out the payor's income and the recipient's income. There's a calculator right online. It will give you a rough idea as to what you would anticipate. And if that's substantially different than what is being, either being paid or received, uh, then you should see a, a lawyer and uh, get a consult to determine whether or not it's worth doing. Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Um, lawyers are not cheap these days. When you are spending $150, $200, $300 an hour to litigate an issue that's going to save you $5 a week, it might not be worth it. Mm -hmm. So to buy a, a, an hour of a lawyer's time, to get a sense is, is really super helpful. So I, I can't really give you a specific answer on you know when child support changes. Uh, 
the, the, the change in circumstances, the thing to really think about. Mm -hmm. Has there been a substantial and material change since sure. the last time that you were in court? Got it. Um, and I think those last two bullets right there, uh, decisions will affect you and your children for years to come. Don't get, fight, get, don't get bogged down into fighting over who's right, who's wrong, and uh, nobody wins in a divorce, focusing on what's most important. Talk to me a little bit about the impact on the kids, because I think that, again, one of the biggest uh, places where people procrastinate is they're worried about what kind of impact this is going to have on the kids. You know, in your experience, obviously, I think it can go either way. You know, obviously, the kids could be really upset by, by the divorce, but it could also be a blessing in disguise. So any feedback on that piece? Um, I can only speak to my experience over the last 30 years, and uh, I can't speak as a psychologist or as a counselor, although I have spoken to many, many counselors and psychologists. And, and they all say the same thing uh, generally, and that is, uh, does the initial divorce have an impact on the children? Of course it does. Um, children don't like change initially. Uh, they don't like to see their mothers and fathers uh, splitting. Mm -hmm. Their world changes. But they then, but then the experts then say that more often than not, children are resilient. And it's going to say, and they, I would think it resilient would yeah. be the word. And they out. tend, more often than not, to bounce back. That resilience is based on a number of things. Mm -hmm. It can be based on the parent's relationship moving forward. It can be based on the child alone, the, the personality of the child. Is the child um, resilient? Is the child uh, open to change? Um, more often than not, we see a positive result uh, with respect to children for both parents, mm -hmm. and they tend to kind of fall into uh, a daily routine. Ironically enough, these children will often say to their parents, I know a lot of friends of mine whose parents are divorced because of the divorce rate. So uh, they're not alone. Um, oftentimes, we, uh, more often than not, we have our clients consider counseling for the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, there's very little downside to it. Not all children need it, but it never hurts. Mm -hmm. So um, for the most part, and again, there are always exceptions to the rule, but for the most part, children, children are resilient. They tend to bounce back. As they get older, they start to speak with their feet. Sure. And, <laughs> and they make their own decisions. But uh, for the most part, uh, they'll bounce back. Got it. Okay. Uh, we got one more question right now. Uh, where would you find the best child support calculator? I know you had mentioned something yes. in Massachusetts. Um, you should go on to the uh, Massachusetts Probate and Family Court uh, website. It has a child support guideline mm -hmm. calculator, uh, mass.gov, I believe it is, uh, probate court. Uh, you can simply Google it and type in, uh, for example, what's the probate court child support guideline calculator? And it will give you a Excel-based sheet uh, that you can <clears throat> fill out. You can print it. And I think you can even save it to future reference. Mm. Um, That's something you could actually do in preparation for the meeting with your attorney. And again, to save some time with the You, so you could. Uh, it is helpful in putting things in perspective. Uh, because for the most part, when people are coming to us, uh, we talk about the, the non-CFO person. Mm -hmm. Uh, coming to us with very little background in terms of their spouse's earnings or <clears throat> the cost of health insurance or daycare costs uh, or, or, or dental insurance and optical insurance, all these criteria that play into the calculation, um, they can only have a general number. Once we start to do our homework as attorneys, uh, get all the information necessary, that general guideline <laughs> starts to sharpen and we get a better handle on uh, the guidelines. Uh, in Massachusetts, child support guidelines uh, generally are considered uh, for parties whose incomes together do not exceed $250,000. Any income in excess of $250,000 in those circumstances, uh, the courts then have the discretion to reallocate that additional money. So uh, it really behooves the, both parties to make sure that they have a really good handle on the income of the parties. Mm -hmm. Uh, health care costs, daycare costs, um, dental coverage, those types. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Well, that's pretty much the pre-prepared uh, part of the presentation. You know, we'll ask for some questions. As I mentioned, there was a question <coughs> submitted prior to the um, to the workshop starting, and I'll just read it to you, Russ. And in the meantime, anyone who has any additional questions, uh, feel free to uh, click on that question and answer section on the bottom of the screen. 
type in the question. No one else can see it. We're, we're the only ones that can see it. Um, but the question here is what to consider when negotiating a house buyout. Uh, would you exchange retirement assets for equity? I think what uh, what her concern is, is that um, if she were to refinance the house, that she would have a higher rate than what she had negotiated a few years ago. So she'd like to actually keep the mortgage and everything as is um, and ex potentially exchange a 401k or something like that in exchange for that. So can you talk to uh, talk a little bit about that? A little so bit about first, that. I'll say anything is possible as long as two parties can agree. But let's assume they can't agree for a minute. And now we're standing in front of the judge and one party wants to keep the home and says to the other party, I'd like to buy you out. So the first thing that comes to my mind is, well, if one party is going to keep the home and both people are on the mortgage, how are we going to get the other person's name off the mortgage? Mm -hmm. So you go to the bank and you say, Mr. Bank I, or Mrs. Bank, I'd like to uh, take my spouse's name off the mortgage. Could you give me the document that allows me to do that? And the bank says, no. Mm -hmm. They say you have to refinance <laughs> because the other person who doesn't have the house uh, should have an opportunity to acquire their own home. And without their name being taken off of the mortgage, refinancing, there's no opportunity to do that because their they're, they're loan to debt to asset ratio or whatever right. that calculation is, is too high. Most banks aren't particularly in, interested in taking uh, that chance. But uh, assuming that happens and assuming they can refinance, uh, take out a little extra equity and, and buy the spouse out, that's one way to do it. Now, to answer your question, uh, it becomes a little bit more complicated when, when you trade uh, retirement accounts for equity in a home. I call it trading apples for oranges. So when we have a retirement account, let's say a 401k, and we want to liquidate that 401k to buy something, the first thing that happens, unless we're of a certain age, is what? We get penalized for liquidating it, get 10% penalty, and there's a tax associated with that liquidation. So if you were to liquidate your retirement account, you'd have a tax. Uh, you'll know better than me. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it just jump in. If you're younger than age 59 and a half, then there's a 10% penalty for liquidating assets that are retirement assets like 401ks, IRAs. So um, if I were to trade $100,000 of retirement money in exchange for $100,000 of equity in a home, although the number is 100,000 versus 100,000, it may not be fair. Because that hundred thousand turns into ninety thousand, and then take off a tax of I don't know thirty percent. Now you're at sixty thousand dollars for a hundred thousand dollar asset. Now it may be good for the person who is, you know, keeping the house, but it's not really a fair trade. Now your lawyer would know this presumably, and we would what would be called in our profession taxifying mm -hmm. the uh, the account by increasing. The amount that would have to be paid in order to get an effective uh, net payout of, of, let's say, in that example, hundred thousand dollars. So you have to be really careful when you when you're exchanging apples for oranges. Mm -hmm. as say. Gotcha. So a couple other questions that I've experienced or I've encountered um, along the way when it comes to divorce is one: Can you once the divorce is negotiated, once the judge signs off on it, and it's it's live at this point? And six months, a year later goes by, and you feel like you didn't get a fair shake. Talk to me a little bit about going back and trying to do a, a re-over or a, a do-over, mulligan. Yeah, mulligans uh, are not really popular in the probate court. Uh, the judges, the lawyers, the process is made and set up to make it fairly difficult for do-overs okay. for that uh, Monday morning quarterback concept or, you know, the the uh, I should have, could have, would have done it differently if I had. Uh, oftentimes, and in fact, in every time, uh, parties are getting divorced, the judge asks the parties a number of questions. Did you understand what you signed? Did you sign it freely? Did you sign it voluntarily? Did anybody make you sign this? Do you think it's fair? You don't have to go forward today. You can have a trial. Do you want a trial? And uh, the record is pretty um, loaded. Uh, with information to make it really difficult. Now, mm -hmm. there are those circumstances where um, sometimes people will give will be given a second chance uh, when there's fraud, mm -hmm. when there's misrepresentation, when there's lying on the financial statements, when there's an asset that 
never cropped up in the in the divorce process where the parties forgot about it, or they or one party intentionally hid it and it got discovered. So those th there are circumstances where it happens. It can happen with child support, as we talked about. It's always modifiable. Sure. Uh, in certain circumstances, <clears throat> it can happen with alimony. Uh, it can happen with health insurance and life insurance. In Massachusetts, once you divide your marital assets, they're divided. And once you divide your debt, that's also divided. It can't be reconsidered. Under no circumstances short of fraud or misrepresentation will those assets be recalculated. So you got to be really, really careful about spending the money to do it. Um, there are occasions where people will try, and more often than not, they're disappointed that they, you know, they may hire a lawyer to spend uh, a fair amount of money to get in front of a judge and ultimately not prevail. So be real careful when you're thinking about kind of that. So like all the other slides prior to get organized, you know, have, you know, don't be just 99%, be 100%. You know, you really have to take this seriously because, you know, for all intents and purposes, on uh, barring fraud or some kind of misrepresentation, you got one bite at the apple and, right. uh, and, the, and that's about it. The other question I have for you, Russ, is, and this I think will be our, oh, we do have another question that just popped up. Um, while I'm reading that in a second, but one of the things that uh, has come up is, let's say that one party in the, in, in the, the couple is um, in line for an inheritance. Does that influence, you know, again, I, I think what a lot of people uh, think about when they think about divorce is that for all intents and purposes, it ends up as close to a 50-50 split. So if there's a, an inheritance, whether it's, uh, whether it's minimal, whether it's uh, pretty substantial, does that throw off that scale so that it's factored into the conversation about the 50-50 split? I feel like this is a bar, bar example because <laughs> it, it's loaded. So, Sorry, Matt, so that. that's okay. So, so Massachusetts, says that uh, they divide marital assets equitably, fairly. It doesn't mean equally. Uh, and there are about 17 factors that the courts use to uh, divide uh, these assets. Now, there's a presumption in Massachusetts that you start with a 50-50 split. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it ends that way. Okay. Now, um, among these 17 or 15 or so factors that we look at seriously, uh, contribution to the marriage and likelihood for future assets mm -hmm. is one of them. Okay. Uh, which brings us to the issue of inheritance. Inheritance is a tough one because there are a number of issues that go into whether or not we're going to consider it. I guess the first issue would be whether the inheritance is vested. So if we uh, have two people and let's just say husband is in line for an inheritance with two very healthy parents who have um, a will that says everything is going to go to their, their son, but have no, there's no imminent likelihood that it's going to come to them. That inheritance is not vested. That makes sense. Now, let's say uh, 10 years prior to the divorce, the inheritance comes in. And let's say that inheritance gets commingled into the marital estate in some way, shape, or form. Question one, is it a marital asset? It is. Question two, will it be divided equally? Not necessarily. So it really depends on, is it vested? Did it come in during the marriage? If it did, when did it come in? When we look at marriages, particularly long-term marriages, I remember when I first started practicing, a judge saying to me, you know, in a long-term marriage, people should uh, come in and out in equal comfort or discomfort. Uh, so taking that long-term marriage mm -hmm. with an inheritance that it came in perhaps early in the marriage, uh, it would be likely to be divided equally. Now, you take a short-term marriage where the inheritance came in either a week before or a week after the filing of the complaint. Mm -hmm. Maybe not 50-50, maybe not at all. It depends on the lawyer. It depends on the argument the of the lawyer and the judge. Um, the case law in Massachusetts uh, is clear. It says that if an asset is vested, if that, if that inheritance has been vested, if it's irrevocably vested into a trust, where the recipient is a beneficiary, irrevocably vested, uh, it will be considered. That beneficial interest will be considered. So a lot of things to think about. Got it. Okay. Looks like we've got one more question. Uh, this one's a long one. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, what remedy is there when uh, the other party isn't producing documents as requested um, and that there's some hidden money involved and how is important, how important is it to detail where the money was spent in order to recover that money? So um, this is kind of a two-part question. When we start with the party not producing documents, uh, 
there's generally a paper trail that leads to a certain spot uh, in the process where let's say we have uh, checks written to a certain account and we request that account uh, to be produced by the other party and they start to produce the records and inevitably what happens is the month that is of significance never seems to show up mm -hmm. in the records. So we're going from January, February, March, April, and all of a sudden June is missing and the account has gone up and then down and nobody knows where it is. So the very first thing we do is we subpoena the records right from sure. the source. Um, that generally gives us a, kind of a better idea as, as to where things go. So just to be clear um, for everyone, I don't know how, how people are versed in subpoenaing and what does that actually mean? So we will send out a, uh, once a lawsuit is filed in Massachusetts, a civil lawsuit, uh, the law of the Commonwealth gives the parties involved in litigation the right to send out properly drafted, properly executed subpoenas. Uh, it, is a, uh, it is a command for a party to come to court or to submit to a deposition um, as part of litigation. So oftentimes, and frankly, we, in my firm, it is my office policy that once we get involved with a case, before we walk into court the very first time, more often than not, now, not on every case, but more often than not, um, it's nice to have the other side's financial statements saying how much they earn or how much, what their assets are. But if I'm going into court, I'm not necessarily going to rely on that financial statement. Mm -hmm. If I know that Mrs. or Mr. Jones works at a certain company and they tell me that that's their income, let me find out from the, uh, from the company itself. So I'll send out a subpoena to the keeper of records of that company, commanding them to come to court and give me the documents in front of the judge. Now, they know, and I know more often than not, they don't want to go to court. They say to me, well, do I really need to come to court? Is there another way to do this? And I say, sure. There's an affidavit, sign the affidavit, attach the documents that you would have given to the judge, hand them to me, I'll hand them to the other side and to the judge, and now everybody has the cards on the table. Oftentimes I will do that and send a copy of the subpoena to the other side, the other lawyer, letting them know that their financial statement better be right, because if it's not, I'm going to show the judge what is right and what's not right. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the best way to start off the case. There's no question, there's no misunderstanding, and everybody knows that we're kind of right on the trail, we're gonna move forward. Is, is that common practice or is that, I was just about to say that because I, I've, I've spoken with other folks who use other attorneys, sorry Russ, but <laughs> I've used another attorney and that doesn't seem like a common practice is to go out and subpoena those records and get them straight from the source as opposed to from the divorcing party. The uh, probate court forms require the parties sign their financial statements under the pains and penalties of perjury. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that everybody lies because that wouldn't be accurate, but there are often times where folks are not accurate, either because they don't understand their own pay stubs, their mm -hmm. own financial statements, their own tax consequences. And just because their W-2, line one on their W-2 for the year before said they make $50,000, the probate courts say, that's not their gross income. When they look on line five, for example, on their W-2, which is their total Medicare wages, their income is much higher. Sure. So what they will do oftentimes is they'll look at their pay stuff and say, this is what I, you know, this is my year-to-date income. They won't take off health insurance, uh, uh, retirement accounts and such. So I sent out a subpoena. The very first thing I asked for in the subpoena is W-2 wage statements for that employee for the last three years. And then I know exactly what their income was, what their history was, what their actual income is, and credibility in the probate court means everything. Mm. So if I am able to show, for example, that the other side isn't being accurate for whatever reason, then I have an advantage. My client recognizes that we have the advantage. There's nothing illegal about it. It's mm -hmm. completely appropriate. Sure. And frankly, I say to all the lawyers, mm -hmm. you know, young lawyers in my firm, that it isn't an option. We do it in probably seven, eight out of ten cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, let the other side know. We mean business. Uh, yeah. All right. I think that's a good place to to finish. Any Ross? Any any final thoughts on this? Um, it doesn't look like we have any other additional questions, so I think we'll we'll wrap up here. But any any final thoughts on? No, I I, I want to thank you for uh, having me here. This was great. Um, if you folks need any help or you have any questions in the future, you're certainly welcome to call us. We're happy to schedule an appointment. Uh, we're at 300 Main Street in Worcester on the second floor. You can contact us. Uh, by calling 508-752-0112. Or if you would like, if you're meeting with Brendan and you want a second opinion or me to add my two cents for whatever it's worth, I'm happy to uh, come down and help out. Okay, fantastic. 
All right, Russell, well, thank you for your time today. And uh, I think we'll conclude there. So thank you everyone for attending.